As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, I believe God has a special calling for us. And one way to describe that is, he is calling us to clarity. God is calling his people to clarity out of confusion. And um, one way, there's many ways to bring things to clarity. One way is to recognize that the battle we are in, the spiritual battle that we are in, is a war. A war between good and good mixed with evil. It's not always stark contrast, black and white. It's sometimes good and then good mixed with evil in this battle. It's very subtle. That's why God is calling us to clarity. So I would like to pray with you also. I just want to mention uh, we need to pray for the technology. I, want to, I need to share something on slides, but um, I need to pray for that. But let me just mention a phone call that happened to us not too long ago, just before we came here. We got a phone call from uh, one of the uh, missionaries in Thailand. Uh, she was South African, and she asked us to come and to meet together with a small group in Bangkok to have a special season of prayer for uh, a family, a, lay, a single uh, mom with a uh, son. And uh, so this lady, South African lady, uh, she and her Canadian husband went to Bangkok, and Marilee and I, these two Americans, we went to Bangkok, and we joined to pray for a Romanian with a, uh, someone from Japan, someone from Italy, someone from the Netherlands, somebody from Germany, all Seventh-day Adventists coming together to pray in unity. I was just staggered by this, and I may have left somebody out. There may have been another nation in there too, but Seventh-day Adventists all converging to pray. It was just like, wow, could this have happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago? You know, it's something that can happen now, and it's just phenomenal. So I don't know how many different uh, nations, people, groups, or ages, or genders, all kinds of things that we're, God's taking young, old, male, female, in black, white, east, west, north, south, and he's bringing us together. And my idea is that God loves to hear prayers in the various languages. So in some language, he's not hearing yet, and he needs to hear that. So let's just bow for prayer, and I'm going to ask a special blessing. And uh, John, if need be, uh, I think my file is on, a, on Bill's computer. If we need to switch computers, we can do that if it makes it easier. I have an old computer and it may be um, not cooperating. But let's, let's, let's bow for prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, before we open your word, we want to again just ask for your anointing. Father, we ask that you would meet with us again today. I thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. We want this place to be holy ground. We are asking, Lord, that your blessing would be with us. Please overcome the technical difficulties if need be. And if not, that's okay. Just help us, Lord, to hear what your spirit has to say to the church today. And please, Lord, we ask that you would in our in from your goodness to us, we ask that you would send a double portion of your spirit to us today. Open our hearts and minds to receive it, but not just to receive it, to put it into practical application for the blessing of, of others. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do a little review from yesterday to get back up to speed. 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 8, 2. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. That's where we begin. If we think we know something, we need to lay it at God's feet and ask him, teach us more clearly what this means. What's one way we can be sure that we know that God loves us? Revelation 3.19 says, He, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Let's go a little further. Let's do a little expanding. Let's go to uh, Proverb chapter 1.
Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. This is a precious quote, scripture, and promise. God says to us, turn you at my reproof. And behold, he's going to do two things. Turn at my reproof and behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make my words known unto you. When we turn to God and recognize and receive his correction, it's not always punishment, it's just correction. If we receive it, he will pour out his spirit unto us and make his words known to us in proportion to us turning unto him. Is how I understand it. And I appreciate the comment yesterday that was made um, referencing Psalm 141.5. Let the righteous smite me, and it will be a kindness unto me. It will be an ex Let him reprove me. It will be an excellent oil upon my head. It's just precious. Again, what does a foolish person do? We read in Proverbs yesterday. A foolish person repeats his folly, makes the same mistake repeatedly. That's what a fool does. And what is, that, what is one of the mistakes that a fool makes? What is one of the primary mistakes a fool repeats? He trusts his own heart, right? That's what the Bible says. That a fool repeats his mistake, Proverb um, 20, uh, 26, 11. And he, a fool trusts in his own heart, Proverb 28, 26. And the wise, the wise man, what does the wise man do? He trusts in the Lord with all his heart. Now, Jesus has, he unpacks a lot of this. He says a wise man builds his house on the rock, or we could define it further, the word of God, right? A wise man builds his house on how much of the word of God? Every word, every word. All right, I have a praise. Are you aware that we cannot do God's work without a team, without a concerted effort. I, more and more as time goes by, I realize, you know, we are interdependent. We are to have a noble independence, but we are mutually interdependent. And God designed it that way. It's, it's, a, it's for our blessing. And um, I'll have to, my screen is looking different than I've ever seen it before, but I think I can figure this out. I won't need to change the screen for just a moment. So, um, okay, so... The wise man trusts God with all his heart. And God tells us, my son, my daughter, give me thine heart. And he means all. That's what he's asking for. So um, this is called faith camp. And I thought it would be good to talk about faith just for a moment and let it deepen into our thoughts. You know, if God has called us to clarity, I want to know, I often ask dumb questions. My wife often says to me, why did you ask that question? <clears throat> you know, and, and I, I sometimes am embarrassed because I ask really dumb questions, but sometimes I am amazed at the surprising answers I get that if I didn't ask, I wouldn't have got. I was like, whoa, that's a blessing to get that answer. So um, what is faith? I mean, we just assume what is faith? Is faith believing that God's word is true? Is, is faith believing that there is a God, a creator God, an eternal God? Is that faith? And that his word is true. That is a kind of faith, but this is, faith camp is beyond that. Because that is, we could say that's what the devil believes. He believes there's a God. He believes God's word is true. He believes there's a judgment, and he trembles. But we don't want to have that kind of faith. We want to have the faith that God has for us. Now, let's see. Okay, can you see that? I made the font maybe too small, but this is from Steps to Christ, page 63, if you want to reference it. When we speak of faith, there is a distinction that should be born in mind. There is a kind of belief that is wholly distinct from faith, the existence and power of God, the truth of his word are facts that even Satan and his host cannot at heart deny. The Bible says the devils also believe and tremble, but this is not faith. It is a kind of faith, but it's not what we're really after. We're after something clearer. 
where there's not only a belief in God's word, but a submission to the will of him, reminds me of the presentation that Rudy did yesterday. Submission. There's a whole people on the earth that's looking to do that. Where there's a submission to the will to, of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, and the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So what is faith? It's an entire yielding of the heart to God. Which another way to say that is a wise person. If you want to be a foolish virgin, you would ignore this. If you want to be a wise, and the parable of virgins, the, you have to do this. Submit totally to God. This is what God is asking us to do. So that helps to clarify. Now, <clears throat> I have found over time that something that really helps me is perspective. Let's see. I want to give you some perspective. Uh, some of you may have heard about the flooding that happened in Thailand and other nations right near there, but especially Thailand was hit hard by the flood in 2011, the, the fall of 2011. Um, it was right in our area. And I, 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 I'll tell you some things I don't have graphics for, but um, it became concerning to us when we realized that the dams above us, the one directly above us on the river, uh, right, that was right through our back, go to our back gate, and there's the river. That river, the dam, at one point, the last reported uh, thing we could get on the news was it was at 138% capacity. And then they stopped telling. Um, it, was a, it was a mistake that happened, um, a, a, a series of things that happened. They had had a drought before. I'd never seen the, the, so le little of water in the Central Valley of Thailand than the year before. And so the people were trying to hold back more water in the dam so they wouldn't go through a drought again. And then they were caught by surprise. A series of storms came, and I think it was five, um, storms and it dumped more rain than they ever anticipated and the dams were full and the amazing thing was uh, when the flooding was happening where we were was sunny and nice and beautiful weather for the most part we got some rain but not much not not compared to the water that was coming they had to in order to prevent the dams from bursting they just opened them they never do that unless it's a crisis it was a crisis and there was so much water that it when it hit the Central Valley, it, there's not enough places for it to go off. It just came down as a wall of water going this, this gigantic, slow-moving disaster. And it just took over. Places that had never flooded before were flooding. And it was, people, some people said down, down ways past us, they said the water came up. They never had flooding there before, but it came up so fast. They're suddenly on the roof of their house trying to, trying to deal with this. Where we were, the water came up slow, thankfully. And they had built some uh, earthen dikes to try to prevent it, and it broke the dike, and they built another one. And we were on the inside of the second dike, and so the water was piling up and, and coming up. And when we rented the house that we were in, the landlords told us, um, this house has never flooded. And since we got there, we always saw the river would flood and flood our backyard, and that was normal. Um, but we'd never seen it come up higher. People would cut, our ground was the highest ground in our neighborhood, People would park their motorbikes and stuff in our yard and just that'd be a safe place for them. Um, but this year, that year was different. The water kept coming up. And let's see if I can, uh, this was, uh, I was trying to get to work and Marilee and a friend uh, took me by boat. I ended up walk, wading home. Wading through water long distance is like walking through snow. It just wears you out after a while. It's like, wow. <clears throat> this is our back uh, side of the house we're renting. And where the sandbags are is the back porch where Marilee does cooking. It's an open air thing. And we thought, you know, the water's come up to that. We've heard that it's come up to that before. So we thought, we'll just sandbag that. And then uh, we'll prevent the water. She can keep cooking and so forth. The lesson I learned from this flood is this. This is precious. Hang on to this. If I could have seen the big picture, if we could have known the big picture, we would not have wasted our time, energy, and money on things that were completely irrelevant. We wasted energy and time. We were, we were bailing out, the, the sandbags leaked a little bit, so we were bailing out water off the back porch. And uh, the water kept coming. 
And there was a fellow that uh, we took our car out and we took, we took the motorbike out because the water just kept coming. So how high is this going to get? We were asking, everybody's asking each other, how high is it going to get? And there was one fella that came across the front of our road and we asked him and he made a gesture. He's like, and I thought, he's kind of a clown, kind of a jokester. He didn't have credibility with me. I thought, no, that's not true, but it was true. It, was, it happened, but we didn't know. We didn't, he didn't have credibility with us, so we weren't really understanding that. But the water kept coming, and so we abandoned the back porch, and then we sandbagged the, the doors to the house. And we thought, well, uh, maybe we can pre prevent it from coming into the house. Um, and that was the front door and the back door we had barricaded, but the water was seeping in. At one point, we could look from inside the house and see the water outside, this, this, the windows that go down to the floor, and I could see a couple times I saw fish looking in at us. <laughs> Little fish. Felt really weird. <laughs> And we took this one motorbike and we put it on the steps there to try it, but that still flooded. And um, when we barricaded the doors, we realized the only way to get in and out is to put a ladder and come from the second story down. We took everything upstairs to try to beat the flood. And uh, we would use a boat that way. Um, and then, but it came in, it came in the house. There's Mew trying to do her laundry in the sink downstairs. You know, we thank God because during the flood, we were, we were underwater for over a month. It just came into the house. We just couldn't do anything. And it, we had all these fruit trees on the property, and they all drowned. It was really sad. Nice shade trees and everything, but it all, it all, it all killed it all. Except, you know, the flood killed the bananas. You know it's bad if it kills bananas. Bananas love water. Killed the banana plants, and then it actually killed the mangoes. There's one mango left that's kind of hanging on. And uh, the coconuts are the only thing that survived. The coconut trees made it. They didn't have a problem. <clears throat> that drowned the air conditioning that was on the house there and just kept coming in. Um, so if we'd have known how high that water was going to come, we would have not spent any time putting sand in bags and doing all this stuff and buying supplies and trying to tape up things and putting clay on the way, all this stuff. We, we would have not spent any time on that. So there's a lot of lessons, and I could share more, but let's just switch gears here. Perspective. We have nothing to fear for the future except what? Okay, we, that unless we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teaching in our past history, right? Nothing to fear for the future. Another way I, I like to say that is we have nothing to fear for prophecy except we forget history. And I have, uh, in recent months, in the last few couple of years, I've realized we have, I, I didn't know our history as I needed to know it. Um, things I, did, I had no clue about that God wants us to know. I, I was blessed to know it. Now, I put this little clock up here because uh, I'm going to do an illustration. <clears throat> uh, see if you can catch this with me. Uh, some of you may have seen this before in other places. It's not original with me. I'm just going to use it as an illustration. Um, if we take the time that, that uh, is biblical history for the human race, from the time that God created till the time that Christ returns, that's about 6,000 years is how we understand it from different sources. Um, the scripture says... Um, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. And the time that God has given for probation is like six working days. And then we have a seventh day, a seventh, we have 1,000 years in heaven with God before we come back to the earth made new is how I understand it. And again, I'm open to critique. So so uh, critique me on this, because this is I'm presenting this to you, but I want feedback. Uh, you can come to me afterwards, or however you want to challenge. If you see something, uh, this is not, not uh, I just put this together to help make this clear, this, uh, some points. Um, Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. And it's like, how does that fit into things? People say, well, he's not coming. And, but if you start seeing some perspective, it, you start thinking things differently. If you take a clock and you put it, take the 6,000 years and you put it on the face of a clock, 
One minute equals 100 years. Five minutes equals 500 years. And the 12 hours equals 6,000 years. So Adam lived for 930 years. So he died, before, so he was, you could say at about uh, nine after or so. On, a, on, a, on this scale, he, he passed away. He died at night. He, before he became a thousand years old, he died. Does that make sense? Are you catching this? Um, and this also hit me one day. God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the tree of knowledge and evil, in that day you will die. And I always said, well, he never died that day. But if you count it on the big scale, he died within the first day. Before the first thousand years were, he died. They both did. I don't know the death date, how old Eve lived, but I'm sure she died in that same period, sometime in there. Okay, so this is where Adam lived 930 years and he passed away. So now I'm going to do some more rapid, uh, if you get the concept here, we'll go a little faster. This is when Noah's time was, about here, quarter after. Now remember, God has given us this time to work and then he's coming back. He's sowing the seed. So here's Noah's time. Here's about where Abraham is. And uh, you could refine this, and there's a lot more I could unpack, but for time's sake, we're just going to hit some highlights. Here's Moses' time. And of course, the Exodus and all that happens. Here's David. Just before half our time is up, we have David. King David's time. And then we have Daniel. And by the way, for those who would be appreciating this, Daniel's time is the same, about the same time as Buddha was around. Uh, I think, um, if I remember right, Daniel was about 18 and Buddha was around 49, somewhere in that range. Keep going a little bit. Here's Jesus' time. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. He didn't say it in a, in a vacuum. And you could put, and I don't, I'm not blowing this up to show details, but Jesus' time, Jesus was born, the cross, Pentecost, and the gospel went to all the known world in 30 years. In Paul's lifetime, it went. So that's just there for, you know, every hundred years is a minute, so things move pretty fast on the big clock. Then after, the, after Pentecost and the gospel going to the world, we began the Dark Ages. How long is Dark Ages? The Catholic Church began and the Dark Ages began and we had over 1,000 years, right? So that's 10 minutes of Dark Ages on the scale. That's a big chunk. And just, just to note, before, uh, before Jesus' time, there was 400 years of silence between Malachi and John the Baptist. There wasn't a prophet. It was silence. And then there was dark ages after. It's, this, big, this big perspective is really something. After the dark ages, revival started happening. And at one point, the, the Gutenberg Press printed the Bible. Now, I understand there was printing presses prior to this in China. But this is where the Bible was printed. Just, uh, I think it was, uh, you could say six minutes before midnight or seven minutes before midnight, somewhere in there. And, and then the rest of this that needs to fit in here, I, I, I didn't know how to technically do this, so I'm going to switch to a different scale. Just put it on PowerPoint, okay? Because I don't know how to fit it in here because it's so much that happens. I think this is where it switches. Oh, no, I got a couple more here. Uh, just at five minutes to midnight, um, it's so close, I, I didn't want to put them on the same line, it might get confusing, but Columbus discovered America, and Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis in Wittenberg and began a, a whole change in what was going to take place. So. This is the time frame we're in. Now, from that time until the time that Jesus comes back, if this is the scale, if this is correct, a lot's got to happen. 
Do you remember the, the, remember the quote that says the final movements will be rapid ones? Does that give a new sense to this? And Jesus said, he, or the, Paul said, that the work would be cut short in righteousness. A short work would the Lord make on the earth. Oh, I do have one more on here. The USA was founded a couple minutes later, 1776. So now we're down to not much time. So I think we're going to switch scales now. No, I still got another one. Okay. And then October 22, 1844. What's this? Beginning of the judgment. We heard yesterday people talking about the, the, there's a whole people group talking about judgment. And by the way, Buddhists are clear that there's going to be a judgment. They know there will be a judgment. They have a different way of looking at it. It's due to karma. You're going to reap what you've sown, but they believe in a judgment. They, it's, it, there's no escaping it in their mind. So there's a lot of percentage of the earth believes in a judgment. So we're, we're getting down to the end. Let's see here. All right, so I'm just going to put down minutes like, you know, 58, 59, midnight. So I'm just going to do some things. Just, just, this probably could be done different ways. This is how it seems clear to me. So we've got uh, the modern spiritualism movement began with the Fox sisters, the knocking on the, the rapping thing in uh, New England. The evolutionary theory came out with Darwin's theory. And uh, uh, the latter rain began to pour out, we we're told, at that time. And there was the Industrial Revolution. All kinds of technology and things happening uh, at that time, it's, you know, how do you, how do you put that on a little clock thing? So, and there's a lot more other things. There's all kinds of uh, groups that began, um, other religions, just amazing. We could unpack that sometime. Uh, at the last minute here, we have World War I and World War II, and then I don't know when we go off the clock. I don't know, yeah, I don't know how to figure this out, but um, it's not necessarily exact science, but then we had the 9-11 attack. Um, Somewhere in here, we had the, the prayer initiative for God's people to begin praying. Seventh-day Adventists praying seven days a week. Uh, it's seven in the morning, seven in the evening for those who are able to and can. And when I heard that, I, we started doing that in our home. And uh, the Revival and Reformation needs to be our first priority. Why? Why? I mean, we're, we're, we're at the end. If this is anything correct... And God is calling for his people to be, as we heard in the devotional this morning, John 17, he wants us to be united with him for this final thing. He wants us to be one with him, and then we'll be one with each other. And of course, the latter rain has to be poured out yet. And uh, 1 John 4, 17, it says, As Jesus is, so are we in this world. That has not happened yet. That's a prophecy. It's going to happen. God has to seal his people, and the gospel has to go to all the earth. Revelation 14, 12. God is going to one day say, here they are. Here they are. Here's my people. He's going to pull back the curtain. He's been waiting. He's not going to do this until it's ready. When he's put his stamp on his people, and he's, he knows it's, he's going to say, here they are. This is my people. And he said that in the past with one person. It's considered the oldest book in the Bible, book of Job. God said, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect. And Satan says, I don't believe a word of it. Let me test him. And you know the story, Job chapter 1, chapter 2. Job was hit. When God says, here they are, I expect we'll be tested. I, there's a missionary friend of ours who... Um, before they launched, he, t he was telling me, asking what kind of work he had done before he was an engineer. And he said to me, don't tell my son, because I usually don't explain it, because I asked him what kind of work he did. I don't usually explain it this way. He says, in my work as an engineer, he says, I get paid to break things. He said, I want my son to actually understand it that way. But he said, that's what, I, that's what I get paid for. I get paid to break things. So he would test, he would stress test things to see how much they could handle. And God is going to open the door and say, you don't believe a word of it, Satan, but you have to test them to find out. The whole universe needs to know because the universe is looking down. 
they're looking at me and they're saying, God, are you letting him up here? No, we're not ready for that yet. You're going to let her come up here? No way. We don't want a second rebellion. God says, let me show you. Let me show you. They're ready. And then he lets his people go through the final last time. The worst time of trouble since has ever been a nation. And his people only reflect the character of Jesus, no matter what is thrown at them. So the bride has made herself ready. And the mystery of God is finished. And there's going to be a battle. And Jesus will say, it's done. I, behold, I come quickly. And we will say, those who go through to the end, this is our God. We have waited for him. We did not fall for the counterfeit. We waited for him. The one that walked on the earth was not the right one. The one that looked, spoke, did miracles like Christ, but had something amiss, he was not the one. We waited for the real one, and he will save us. So where we are in the stream of time, I don't know exactly. This is, a, this is not an exact thing. But I know that in the prophecy of the ten virgins, it's clear there's a delay. Can we all agree on that? There's a delay. They sleep. It's a delay. It's prophesied. There's a delay. And then there's a surprise. Behold! You know, there's ten sleeping, but somebody was awake because someone heard it shouted, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they woke up. And so I, I, I expect, and this, this is my own thinking here, so you're welcome to critique me on this, but I think we're in the delay phase. I think it's actually, we're over time. This is the delay time. So people, oh, he hasn't come. All things continue as they have from the beginning. No, no, no. We're, I mean, we could be milliseconds past in the delay, but that's, there's not going to be much more time. God's going to cut his work short and finish it. That's how I believe it, how I understand it. First a delay and then a surprise. Um, and what's happening on the earth right now during this time? What's happening in the earth? What's happening in the church? I think the next picture, um, I, I took this, I think this is the next picture. Um, I took this in Korea. <laughs> you know, they say a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I don't remember what the ad was, but I just said, Merrily, wait, before I get in the plane, I've got to get this one. <laughs> this speaks a thousand words to me. I could unpack this a lot, but I won't. <clears throat> Jesus is about to come, and in a sense, we're like sheep to the slaughter for the enemy. The wolf is coming in. We must get <laughs> ready. And this is not how to be ready. <laughs> Last night, I, he I heard the... Um, Katie was saying, we have so much stuff. And I, I, yeah, I feel like this too, like we have so much stuff. We need to lean down. You remember the, remember the, the prophecy that uh, was given to Ellen White when she it was going up the hill and they had to cut loose the wagons, first thing? Cut loose the wagons. That was preparation for taking off your shoes and socks. Eventually, you're going to take off your shoes and socks. That's, you, you know, you're going to go in with minimal. Uh, but the wagons are the first thing. If you don't cut loose the wagons, well, then you'll probably be like this and you know if, if you brought <laughs> if you brought a lamb like this to the temple for a sacrifice what do you think the priest would say <laughs> if they were honest to the word of God it cannot have spot blemish or bloating and probably you know <laughs> God wants a sacrifice a living sacrifice not a dying one he wants something else I don't know what the next picture is. It's probably just a blank, so I'll just do that. Any comments, thoughts, questions, challenges you have? Uh, is this speaking to you at all? Is the big picture helpful? If you don't have the big picture, can you waste a lot of time, energy, money, effort, and it's on totally irrelevant things? I, I was living my life that way. And as I see this, it kind of kind of pulls me up short. In that little bit of time we have left, 
I don't know if I can go back or not. Let's see if I can. Yeah. It's obvious there's not much time. Whatever it is, God is giving us grace on this. And his mercy is not willing that any should perish. But do you realize, it hit me one day, and I was telling this to John. John says, can you share that again? It hit me one day that when, that, when Jesus comes, when that last little bit of time is gone and evaporated, that means never again will there be a problem of sin like we've, like we've seen on this earth. There will never be a time again, once he cleans this up and there's a, a cleansing of fire and all this, once he, once he comes back, it's over. It's gone. Never again. But that has an implication to it. That means you can, once you're past that time, you can never again sacrifice and suffer for Jesus' sake. Not like this. This is the last little bit where you could actually, you and I have the privilege, we can actually suffer for his sake. It's an opportunity that is a golden opportunity we'll never get again. It's gone for eternity, never happen again. If you, want to, if you want to know what that's like, you want to taste a walk with Jesus on this side, you have to do it now. If you want to give all for him, you have to do it now. You, you know, once he comes, it's, it's sealed. You can't go back. He's not going to let it happen again. So I just urge you to consider, as I'm considering, what does that mean? What does that mean? And God's going to give all kinds of wake-up calls yet. You know, right now there's a little bit of a lull, but um, when there's earthquakes and tsunamis and other disasters and fires and earthquakes, floods, I mean, I realize it's like a wake-up call. And um, it's just realizing there's only a little bit of time left. What are you going to hang on to? So is God calling you? to use this last little bit of time in a special way that maybe is different than you had before? I think he is. He's calling us to clarity, not just on theological truth, although it is included. He's calling us on clarity on how he wants us to spend our time. Now, let me give a warning here. This, this also was a warning to me. You could go to the mission field, you could learn the language, fluently. You can go to the mission field and you can give everything you have. Give it away before you go and while you're there. You could even become a martyr and lay down your life in service and you could still miss the point. If the motives are not cleansed, if you don't have the love of God for doing it, 1 Corinthians 13 says it'll be like noise to God. It'll be a stench to him. We have to have our motives cleansed. That's the hardest thing. We, we don't even know. I don't know my motives. I kind of get a glimpse sometimes. I, I, um, I'm showing you the clock here and I'm trying to look at the clock there. And, and the, the, I don't know if it's because of my height or what, but it's exactly got a, got a, uh, a glare. I can't read it. So let me see. What what do I need to stop here? Is this my stopping time? Okay. What's God going to do? I didn't have time to put together the quotes. We look around. And we see a contrast between what God said he wants, what he's calling us to, and what's actually happening. What's he going to do? He has a plan. And there's different ways it can be expressed. <clears throat> but this is, this is I'm, I'm just sharing with you the, my current understanding, uh, where I'm at uh, in my understanding. And that is, God has in reserve people he's preparing. Right now, we're told there, some of them are in the grossest error. But he calls them his 11th hour workers. They have character. They may not understand a bunch of stuff, but they have character. They may be in some of these dark, unentered places. Um, another place it's called the, the last hour workers. And if we don't receive what God is offering us, if we refuse it, he will 
raise them up, and they will have a zeal far exceeding our zeal. They will come in and take our crown. They'll take our place. And that is, that I don't want someone to take my place. I want to have an opportunity to serve at this time. Even if my only opportunity is to lay my life down to help someone get a boost to finish, I just want to give them everything I have to help them to do it. If someone has the zeal, and I believe God is raising up people, I have a hunch that it's happening in places we will be surprised at. Some of these places where um, we were hearing about missionaries serving that are not normal places. God has shielded them from a bunch of stuff, and they are being trained character-wise. I started to wonder. I have a question in my mind. This is my own question, and then I'll take questions from you guys. Um, so think about it if you have any questions. But this is this. I'll challenge you on this because character is so important in God's plan. I am believing that He is serious about raising up an army of youth, rightly character trained. Where does character training happen for youth? In the home, and when does it happen? From, actually it can be from prenatal, if it's done well. Um, mother can prepare, but for the, from the time that conception all the way through, even before that actually, in the marriage form, all of that can be part of it. And then the first three to seven years, something like that, five, seven years, that's where the character is set. And I wondered, has God, can God actually complete his work without raising up a generation like that? So when I think of that, then I think of who are the greatest missionaries on earth? Mom. Mothers should have the highest place in our thinking of missionaries. And I'm going to use a term, and forgive me because I'm going I'm to uh, maybe define it a little different, but bear with me on this. Give me some slack on this. I've thought about the, you know, since I got into missions, I hear the term unreached people groups. And I've been focusing on many unreached people groups. But it hit me one day, and this term is not exactly applied. You may have to use different language to do this, but the largest unreached people group on the planet. Who is it? It's the next generation. It's across the board. Unless they are one to Christ, they are, you can, you can be winning a Buddhist, a Muslim, to know about God's love while your own backyard is deteriorating and you have nothing. God wants us to build on rock that's stable. And um, I, I saw, we did a training, and I saw during the training they had a, a, a whiteboard. And it was said at that meeting, the one who was presenting, that here's Jesus, and then we make a disciple. He, there's a disciple of Jesus, and then we make another disciple, and about the, the second generation it kind of falls off. And I was like, well, why is that? And then it just hit me, and I jumped up, and I said, wait, it's the wrong model. So I erased that and I put, here's Jesus, here's a disciple. Now we bring someone else to Jesus and he's connected to Jesus and Jesus makes disciples. We don't make disciples of ourselves. If everyone's connected to Jesus, that's the strength. So he wants us to make disciples of Jesus. We bring them to him and he converts them and makes them his disciple. I don't want a disciple of me. That'd be horrible. I don't need that. I need someone to reflect God. You don't need another one of me. We need, we need someone who's connected to God to show us how that happens. And that's what mothers do. And mothers who are understanding this are not just training their children um, that they can get an A+, plus, that they know what's, what's in the Word. That's good. But I know there are students who can put down, I know the Seventh-day Sabbath is correct. I know that when you die, you sleep in the grave. And, and they say, you believe that? Yes. Are you going to keep the Sabbath? Oh, no. I just know it's true. No. When, when a parent is teaching the children correctly, they'll be teaching out of their inner heart. The kids catch the spirit of the person. I think I can give this illustration. I think it's okay because they do it uh, publicly. I won't mention names on this one, but uh, a missionary couple who was serving in Thailand, uh, the husband and wife, and they had children, and they, he told me later, uh, they'd served for a long time there, um, he said he went to work, he was working at a health um, institute, an Adventist Health Institute, and he said he would go to work and work with the team there, a bunch of Thai, many ties there, and he said uh, one, one day he went to work, happy and cheerful, and the, uh, one of the Thai staff looked at him and said, 
what's wrong? He said, what do you mean? He said, something's wrong. He said, what do you mean something's wrong? He said, there's something wrong. And the man asked him, did you have a fight with your wife? And this missionary said, well, yeah, I did. I didn't have time. I came to work and I didn't have time to resolve it. He says, I could tell. And he just went on with the day. And it happened, he said it happened once, but then it happened several times. When he had a dispute at home, he went to work and his staff could pick it up. And they're, not, they're just, you know, some are, are Thai, some are Buddhist, some are Christian, some are not. And um, that, when he said that to me, I thought, that's interesting. Because we are told there's an atmosphere around every soul. It's either one of life-giving or one of self-centeredness. And people pick up on it. And if you walk into a room when there's someone who is uh, unselfish, it's a blessing. And people can see a glow or they sense, they may not see, but they sense something. And kids pick up on this. We noticed, we noticed that uh, being away from the, the media saturation of the U.S., that uh, sometimes missionary families would, would carefully select uh, media to bring into the home, not connected to the public television, but select media, and then have their children watch it on a special occasion. And it was uh, amazing to us when we watched children, many times where a child would watch the whole program, the whole movie, and the part that was the part you kind of like, well, I wish that part wasn't in the movie. The kids would pick up on that, and that's what they talk about. They would amplify that and, and brag on that, and they would act that out and talk about how that funny face was or that strange saying of that, that man or that woman. They just kind of amplified it. Why? Why did they do that? You're hoping they ignore that. That's the part that stood out, and they amplified it. Why? Because our nature is in harmony with that unless it's transformed. We should avoid reading, seeing, or hearing anything that suggests an impure thought. Why? So we can bring, let God help us to bring every thought, every feeling, every motive into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, every feeling, what is that? Character and motive is part of that. What's, what's, what's God speaking to you? Is this making any sense? Is this giving a perspective? What if God is holding back for a generation and Satan is doing everything he can to take the mothers out of the home, to distract them, to give them a double-mindedness so they're teaching the kid facts but they're not teaching from the heart? And What's going to happen? He's got to find someone who's doing the thing right. Who's got, a, who's got a thought that God's impressed you with that you should share for the rest of the group to hear? Who has, what's God been speaking to you? Yes, Peter. I was just going to say, when the foolish versions ret uh, returned, they were told that he doesn't know them. And so I thought that that re represents that they didn't have character of Christ. Wow, thank you. Good, good. Someone else, I know God's been speaking to you. We've been praying for this, that God would bless this time. Yes, I see another hand. Uh, I believe it's especially important for us in our day to understand more deeply the books of Daniel and Revelation. This is why it says that we are only babes as far as understanding truth in all its uh, bearings is concerned. And another place in 8T302, she says we, we should make the study of Revelation a first priority in our study. And we're just skimming it over, just barely skimming over it. Correct, correct, correct. Who else? Thought, comment, question, okay. Irene. So this is just what I read in my worship this morning, and it just dovetails with what you shared. Can I read a short paragraph? Please. Bend to the microphone so that everyone can hear it. All right. Um, it starts, the great sacrifice that's been made to save souls shows us their worth. When the precious soul is once lost, it is lost forever. She says, I have seen an angel standing with scales in his hand weighing the thoughts and interest of the people of God, especially the young. In one scale were the thoughts and interests tending to heavenward. In the other were the thoughts and interests tending to earth. And in this scale were thrown all the reading, whoops, sorry, of storybooks, 
thoughts of dress and show, vanity, pride, etc. Oh, what a solemn moment. The angels of God standing with scales, weighing the thoughts of his professed children. Those who claim to be dead to the world and alive to God, the scale filled with thoughts of earth, vanity and pride quickly went down, notwithstanding weight after weight rolled from the scale. The one with the thoughts and interest tending to heaven went quickly up as the other went down, and oh, how light it was. I can relate this as I saw it, but never can I give the solemn and vivid impression stamped upon my mind as I saw the angel with the scales weighing the thoughts and interest of the people of God. Said the angel, can such enter heaven? No, no, never. Tell them the hope they now possess is vain, and unless they speedily repent and obtain salvation, they must perish. And I read that several times, and I read it not thinking about God's people, I read it about thinking about me, and where my thoughts are through the day, and the percentage that are not heaven-centered. But it, it also applies to our youth. Yes, wow, sobering thoughts, sobering thoughts. Anyone else? Okay, Bill, I see a hand here. Mike, I, I have a question, and this question may be way out of line, but it has been something that has troubled my mind, <clears throat> and I've never been able to come up with an answer for it. And I, it, it came up again when you mentioned the importance of the mothers being missionaries in the home and how important that is and our children being the unreached. You know, I spent time in, I've spent time in the mission field, and yet back home I had five children and five grandchildren who desperately needed some sort of spiritual help there. Do I need to be there? Do I need to be over in the mission field? What about the verse that says, if you love mother and father and your family more than me or whatever, you have no part with me? These are real wrestling points, and I've never been able to come up with an answer to that, but I think it fits in with the idea of mothers being missionaries and that, that could go for mothers and fathers also who's supposed to be the priest of the household yeah I think the best place to get our answers is from directly from God's Word and his spirit teaching you and uh, humans we can give opinions um, but unless we can show you inspiration uh, we could lead you to make a misstatement on that um, I have seen um, it, it actually it was very difficult to see where there was a missionary family and we went to visit a Buddhist family, a pretty well-off Buddhist family. And they brought their children with them. One was very young. And the Buddhist family, they had a little boy playing with some quite nice toys, like a, a train thing made out of wood stuff. And the missionary uh, child went in and took the things and was grabbing them and making the other boy, like, what's going on? It was like a fight. And, it was, and the, the Buddhist boy was very calm and giving and but the, the, the Christian one was not. And I thought, oh, it's just a wrong contrast. And it's very difficult to see that. Um, we, the, the, if the Buddhists see a lower standard, which they think Christianity is a lower standard, they just reject it. They, you know, they, they have high moral standards. Even if they're not living it, they have a high standard. And if, if a Christian family shows uh, a family that's well-behaved and obedient and respectful, people all over the world, they look at that and say, that's a miracle. That's more of a miracle than healing of cancer. It's really a miracle today, absolute miracle. There's a, there's a situation where uh, uh, a family had some small children and um, they, were try, they, they were trying to change their ways to, to re, uh, reform a little bit and train the child. And the child were used to always getting their own way. And the parents were realizing we need to be able to correct our children and have them re appreciate that. But as they began that switch, it was a battle. And one of the, one of the first things that happened was uh, the, the little child was playing with something that they had been clearly told not to, was a piece of uh, equipment, and uh, the father said, no, did, you're not allowed to do that. Just a little, little child. And the little child ran to mother. I was, um, anyway, shocked at what happened, but the, the, the little child said, screaming, daddy told me no. And that broke my heart. I thought, are we doing that to God? 
When God tells me no, I say, Daddy told me no. I'm going to do my own thing. When it should be the exact opposite. Praise God, he told me no. He stopped me. Before I ever knew the Lord, I was riding my motorcycle in the, in the, in the city where I was going to college, and I was passing a, a, a school bus on a four-lane road, and I heard this loud, clear word, stop. I slammed on my brakes, and as soon as I did, a car came from front of that bus and would have, I would have gotten in a collision. I don't know what would have happened, but injury for sure, possibly worse. And um, I looked back to see if somebody in the bus was hanging out the bus. The door windows are all closed, and I could not figure out what happened. I mean, later I realized God was speaking to me. I didn't know that at the time, but it was like, stop. But I had been trained to obey, to stop instantly, and it saved my life. At least saved me from terrible accident. We need to be able to have immediate, first-time obedience to God. And I'm not there yet, but I want to develop that character. When God says, stop, we stop. When he says, go, we go. When he says, change, we change. There's a time in the Bible where people were ready, baptized with the Spirit. We're going into Asia. What would the Holy Spirit say? Stop. Don't. Do not go to Asia. Why? The Holy Spirit's going to say, go to Macedonia. God has to be in charge of his of his of his flock. Do you know in the history of the Adventist Church, the General Conference president was ready to send missionaries into China. Had a burden for China. My wife found this in uh, the writings of Ellen White. She counseled that leader, do not send missionaries to China or any other Oriental country yet. What? We're supposed to go to the mission field. We're supposed to go to the Orient. She said, no, not yet. Not until the people, the people have reached a higher spiritual tone. Don't go there yet. Wait. So when we go in, we have the character that will make a difference. Do you understand that in most countries outside of uh, the U.S., and maybe, maybe uh, I may be blind on some of this, but in many countries I've seen the educational system is rote learning. You know, you repeat after the teacher. You become reflectors of men's thoughts. And so when someone sees you, they copy you. If that's what a Christian is, they copy without getting the character. And so if we go in with a low spiritual tone, they're going to start copying at that point, and then it goes down from there. That we have to connect them to Jesus, which means we have to be, and it has to be durable. Durable righteousness that can stand difficulties, and that's why they come. In our heart, there is something called latent sin or hidden sin or sleeping sin. It's described like this. You can go for a day, a week, maybe months, and you think, I'm over that sin but it's still there sleeping. And then some event will happen, and that thing just flares back up. I didn't know that was still there. Exactly. That's why God allowed that circumstance, to bring that up so we can say, wow, I don't want that. Lord, please help me to expel that thing from my soul. What is faith? What did we read in the beginning? How, what's one way to describe faith? Entire submission of the will and heart to God. This is what God's waiting for. And I believe there's two places to get character, either when you're a child or when you're converted, then you start learning. And there's two places where it's refined intensely. Two, two, that's clear to my mind, two most important places. One is in the family. Stay in the family. Don't run, off from, don't run away from home if you're a child. If you're married, stay with your spouse. You'll get refined. The other place that's most intense is stay in the church. Don't abandon Stay in the, you, will get, you will get polished, I will get polished together if we stay with God's people. He's not taking one person into the kingdom. He's waiting to take his people in like he did before, right? He didn't take Caleb in separate. He didn't take John. He waited, and they waited to go together. And we're not going unless we go together. That's how I understand it. When I went to the mission field, I started taking pictures immediately. What was I taking pictures of? What was I taking pictures of? When I took my camera and I took a picture, what was I taking pictures of? Something you hadn't seen before. Something that was different. Something I had never seen before. Right? Or I wanted to show someone something different. People take pictures of what's different. If you look like the world, you talk like the world, if I look like the world, I, people don't care. You're just like me. God is asking us to be special like him connected to him. People will take note. And he wants us to be united. That's not happening anywhere, except it's going to happen here. 
Any last thought before we pray? I'm reminded of a passage that we read in Gospel Workers recently. There was a minister who got up and he preached a very convicting and powerful sermon and afterwards the man came to him and said, if these things are true, what shall we do? And that minister was so struck by the word we, what shall we do? You mean I have to do something? That he was absent from his post for three weeks wrestling with God to know what really was his duty and when he returned, it was to bring about a revival with an unction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I just feel like it's so easy to talk about these things, but how, how many of us are in that enviable quarter that are all set up and ready? You know, all of us maybe want to do missions, but who's sufficient for these things? Rebecca, you are touching on a core issue God doesn't expect us to do this in isolation. He may, we may have to, but he wants us to do it as a people as much as possible. Gather together for strength and then serve, and then gather together for strength and serve, something like that. And Natalie, did you have a, a thought? Or you? I just wanted to mention, as you said again, that um, we need to be asking God to be in charge. Because he's the one that knows. You know, like Bill's question, you have to wrestle that with God because he's the one that knows when our family's going to be responsive and when they're not, when it's better for us to go over there or, you know, exactly what we should be doing. Like you said, if we're trying to go to China and we're supposed to go to Macedonia instead, God's the one who has to be in charge. And Mrs. White uses the words earnestly inquire. And that's not, you know, we've talked about that before at Faith Camp. It's not just a... Lord, help me to know, and then be done with it. It's earnest, and it's over and over and over. I mean, earnest by itself implies that you really, really want an answer, and you're not going to stop asking until you get one. So that's just something that, you know, I keep being reminded of when people talk about where should I go, what should I do, how should I go, how should I do. It's like we have to ask God those questions yes. because... We're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different skills and talents. And we might try to put ourselves into a, a round hole and we're a square peg, you know? We might try to think, well, I've got skills in this. I should go here and do this. But God knows that we would be better served doing something we have no skills for so we can remember our dependence. I don't know. You know, it's just an example. But we have to ask God. Amen. And we can ask God individually and collectively. Rebecca's question stirs my soul because couldn't this be a venue where these things kind of happen, where we don't do things the same? Maybe God will do something we have never thought of before if we seek him. Maybe this will be the place that we'll come together and we'll, 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 we'll find a, a way, a method, a plan, or something that how we come together to actually seek him more earnestly. As a, I don't know. I'm looking for what's higher than the highest human thought. Um, so many thoughts, but I think I need to stop. Um, let me share this quote. I think it's one sentence. Ellen White recommends a prayer. We should pray daily. I just found this recently. Here's the prayer. Lord, take from us what thou dost choose to take but withhold not thine Holy Spirit from us. When I read that, it jumped off the page. I thought, wow, this is the prayer I need. Lord, take from me what thou dost choose to take, but take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then us. Do the same for us. If we have to have the sanitarium in Battle Creek burned down or the printing press burned down, take it, Lord. Just don't withhold your Holy Spirit. If you have to do something that looks like the church is about to fall, please take it, but don't let us not have your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, pour out your Spirit. I'm wondering if we should take a few minutes 
the last few minutes of this hour to bow in prayer individually or with whoever is nearby. Take a few minutes to think. Pray. Ask God. Is he impressing what he wants you to do? What is it that he needs you to say, take whatever you choose to take, even this, from me. But don't withhold your spirit. If we don't have God's spirit, what do we have, folks? How can, how can we continue to walk calling ourselves the people of God if we don't have his spirit and, and if we don't recognize that we are poor in spirit unless we have him then we haven't even started down the, king, the path to the, into the kingdom we need him and we need to pray earnestly if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn today from us could we continue doing the work we're doing if we could it'd be scary if it, if it would just collapse and fall down that's probably that we're doing the right work should we gather in small groups and pray is that what you're thinking Let's do that. Let's gather in small groups to pray and just ask God, take from us what, we, what you choose to take, but withhold not thy Holy Spirit. Every gift is included in the Holy Spirit. There is everything there.